The beginnings of Sears date all the way back to the 19th century, when Richard Sears began selling watches to supplement his income as a railroad station agent in North Redwood, Minnesota. Richard was born into a wealthy family, but his father lost the family fortune in a speculative stock deal shortly before his death in 1879. Sears moved across the state to work on the railroad, and while in North Redwood, a jeweler refused delivery on a shipment of watches. Richard purchased them and sold them at a low price to other station agents, making a profit. In 1886, he started a mail-order watch business based in Minneapolis by the name of R.W. Sears Watch Company. That same year, he met Alva Curtis Roebuck, a watch repairman. The following year, Sears and Roebuck relocated their business to Chicago, and the company published their first mail-order catalog, offering watches, diamonds, and jewelry. Two years later, in 1889, Sears sold his business for $100,000, which is the same as $3.3 million in 2023. What an absolute successful company Sears built in just two years. After the sale of the business, Sears took a few years away from the city by moving to Iowa with the plan to become a rural banker. But in 1892, he returned to Chicago and established a new mail order business with Roebuck again as his partner, selling the same sorts of goods. While the company began with the name AC Roebuck Watch Company, the name changed the following year in 1893 to Sears Roebuck and & Company, and they began to diversify their product offerings. Sales hit $400,000 this year. Before the Sears catalog, Folks living in rural small towns would often have to purchase supplies at higher prices on credit from local general stores who offered a more limited selection of goods. Prices were negotiated and customers relied on the storekeeper's estimate of creditworthiness. Sears took an opposite approach by offering a large selection at published prices. By 1894, Two years after starting the catalog, it had grown to 322 pages and included new items like sewing machines, bicycles, sporting goods, and even automobiles. By the following year, 1895, the catalog hit 532 pages and sales exceeded $750,000, which is $27 million in 2023 value. During this time of growth, Roebuck left the company, but later returned in a publicity role. Sears offered Roebuck's half of the business to Chicago businessman Aaron Nussbaum, who brought in his brother-in-law, Julius Rosenwald, to whom Sears owed money. In August 1895, they bought Roebuck's half of the company for $75,000, and the company was reincorporated in Illinois with a capital stock of $150,000. Sears and Rosenwald got along with each other, but not with Nussbaum. This led to the two buying his interest in the firm for $1.3 million in 1903. Want to take a second to let those prices set in. In 1895, Nussbaum and Rosenwald bought half of the business for $75,000. Eight years later, Nussbaum was paid $1.3 million for his part in it. That's a 1,600% return. Crazy. With Nussbaum out of the picture, Rosenwald brought the company to a rational management philosophy and diversified product lines to include dry goods, drugs, hardware, furniture, and nearly anything a farm household needed. With their immense growth and success, Sears and Rosenwald took the company public in 1906 with an initial stock placement of $40 million. That's $1.35 billion today. In order to bring the operation public, 
they had to incorporate a new company. So Sears, Roebuck and Company was born in the state of New York, effectively replacing the original company. The success of their IPO marked the first major retail IPO in American financial history. The company traded under the ticker symbol S and was a component of the Dow Jones Industrial Average from 1924 to 1999. In 1906, the same year as the company's IPO, Sears opened its catalog plant and the Sears Merchandise Building in Chicago's West Side. The building was the anchor of what would become the massive 40-acre complex of offices, laboratories, and mail order operations at Holman Avenue and Arlington Street. The complex served as corporate headquarters until 1973 when the Sears Tower was completed and continue serving as the base of the mail order catalog business until 1995. By 1907, under Rosenwald's leadership as vice president and treasurer, annual sales of the company climbed to roughly $50 million. Sears resigned from the presidency in 1908 due to declining health with Rosenwald named president and chairman of the board and taking on full control. The company was badly hurt between the years of 1919 to 1921 as a severe depression hit the nation's farms after farmers had overextended their holdings. To bail out the company, Rosenwald pledged $21 million of his personal wealth in 1921. The following year, Sears had regained financial stability. Rosenwald decided to shift emphasis to urban America and brought in Robert E. Wood to take charge. Rosenwald oversaw the design and construction of the firm's first department store, built on land within the company complex. In an effort to devote more time to philanthropy, Rosenwald resigned the presidency in 1924 but remained as chair until his death in 1932. Despite its remote location on the outskirts of Chicago, its success led to dozens of additional openings across the country, many in conjunction with the company's mail order offices, typically in lower middle class and working class neighborhoods. This was considered highly unconventional at the time, when shopping was concentrated in city centers. But through World War II, there was an extensive streetcar network in Chicago and other U.S. cities. Rapidly increasing car ownership and the brand's huge popularity also helped attract customers out to the suburbs. Sears retail stores were pioneering and broke the conventions of the time in three important ways. First being their location away from central shopping districts. Second was their innovative store design. And third was an unconventional product mix and retailing practices. Other stores at the time were designed with an architecture that drove merchandising needs rather than the desired outer appearance. Sears stores were amid residential areas occupied by their target audiences and had ample, free, off-street parking. In 1913, Sears launched the Kenmore brand, and in 1927, they launched Craftsman. The company's first store opened on February 2, 1925. Sears was also a pioneer in creating department stores that catered to both men and women. It de-emphasized the latest clothing fashions in favor of practical and durable clothing and allowed customers to select goods without the aid of a clerk. By 1929, the brand operated more than 300 department stores. In 1933, Sears issued a catalog known as the Sears Wish Book, a catalog featuring toys and gifts separate from the annual Christmas catalog. Sears opened its first store in Mexico City in 1947. The Mexican stores would later spin off into Sears Mexico, which in 2020 operated more than 75 stores across the country. 
In July 2021, it was announced that Sears Mexico is considering renaming their stores to distance themselves from its failing former partner in the United States. I looked a bit more into Sears Mexico. They use the exact same logo as the one the American Sears used between 1994 and 2004, just in a color red. As of 2022, a group called Grupo Carso owns 100% of the company, yet they're still using the name and branding of its former parent company. If anyone knows more about Sears Mexico, leave a comment and share your knowledge. In the period of time between the 1920s through the 50s, Sears built many urban department stores across North America and they began to overshadow the mail-order business. Post-World War II, the company expanded into suburban markets to include shopping malls. In 1931, Sears created Allstate Insurance Company and placed representatives in its stores in 1934. In 1959, Sears formed the Hallmark Development Company, whose purpose was to build regional shopping malls for Sears. Hallmark Development was the second largest builder of shopping malls in the country, having developed 80 in total and operated 36 of them. Sears sold Hallmark in late 1995 to General Growth Properties for a deal valued at $1.85 billion or $3.7 billion in today's dollars. At the time, it was one of the largest real estate deals in history. I won't go too far into the weeds on Allstate, but the company went public in 1993 when Sears sold 19.8% of the company in what was the largest IPO to date, valued at $2.4 billion. The company became completely independent just two years later, in June 1995, when Sears spun off its remaining 80% stake in the company distributing 350.5 million shares of Allstate stock to its stockholders. Sears also established their own major national brands of products for their customers, like Kenmore, which sold appliances, Craftsman, which sold hardware and tools, and Die Hard, which sold car batteries. The 110-story Sears Tower opened in 1973 and was the tallest building in the world at the time. Sears sold the building in 1988, just 14 years after opening it, when they moved out of Chicago. In the sales contract, the brand retained naming rights on the building until 2003, although the name wasn't changed until 2009. Sears moved to the new Prairie Stone Business Park in Hoffman Estates, Illinois, between 1993 and 1995. Sears also formed the Discover Credit Card, and at the turn of the 21st century, that credit card business accounted for 60% of the company's profits. However, in 2003, in an effort to return to its retail core, Sears sold its credit and financial business to Citigroup for $32 billion or $53 billion in today's dollars. Before I head into the decline of the company, I want to highlight the catalog. Sears catalog dominated America and had a huge presence in many households, in every corner of the country. It reached every household, so people in very rural areas had access to everything they needed. This included African American homes in the South, who were up against Jim Crow racial segregation practices. Thanks to the catalog, these households were afforded access to the same goods at the same prices as every other household. Sears even offered the Sears Modern Home Catalog, where you could buy a full house. Between 1908 and 1942, more than 70,000 of these homes were sold. They offered 370 designs in a wide range of architectural styles and sizes. They even offered mortgages to customers. 
The loans typically ranged from 5 to 15 years at an interest rate of 6 to 7 percent. Although, due to the timing of the Great Depression, Sears had to liquidate $11 million of defaulted debt. In the first half of the 19th century, you could truly buy and build your brand new house, and every single item inside of it, except maybe groceries, all from Sears. I can't overstate just how massive the company was. As I talked about earlier, Sears diversified its business dealings into many different sectors, and these decisions could very well be why they ultimately declared bankruptcy and shuttered most of their stores. In 1981, Sears bought stock brokerage Dean Witter, as well as real estate franchise Coldwell Banker. In 1984, it launched Prodigy as a joint venture with IBM, which was one of the first major internet service providers in the 90s. Sears spent over $1 billion on the project, but when they sold in 1996, both Sears and IBM together received less than $200 million. The following year, it introduced the Discover credit card. With the company's attention now being pulled into many different directions, they took their eye off the retail ball. The tide really turned for Sears in the 90s, a decade where it made a lot of big moves. They spun off the financial services arm of the business, sold their mall business subsidiary, and acquired a hardware chain and started a home improvement store called The Great Indoors. The cost of distributing the catalog became prohibitive as sales and profits declined, so Sears discontinued their catalog in 1993, firing the 50,000 workers who had filled the orders. In November 2004, Kmart Holdings Corporation announced it would acquire Sears Roebuck & Company for $11 billion after Kmart completed its recovery from bankruptcy. Hedge fund operator Eddie Lampert already owned about 15% of Sears, and he had bought Kmart out of their bankruptcy two years prior. As a part of the acquisition, Kmart and Sears were transformed into the new Sears Holding Corporation. The new company started trading on the NASDAQ as SHLD. Sears sold its single letter ticker symbol S in the New York Stock Exchange that it had held since 1910 to Sprint, RIP. The new corporation announced it would continue to operate stores under both the Sears and Kmart brands. In 2005, the company began renovating some Kmart stores and converting them to the Sears Essentials format, only to change them later to Sears Brands, which is just a bigger Sears store. The combined company's profits peaked at $1.5 billion in 2006. However, just a few years later, things were really tanking at the company. By 2010, the company was no longer profitable. Between 2011 and 2016, the company lost $10.4 billion. How do you lose $10 billion in five years? In 2014, its total debt exceeded its market capitalization, which meant they were insolvent. In 2010, Sears had more than 3,500 stores in the U.S., and by 2017, they had only 695, a near 80% reduction. Sears spent much of 2014 and 15 selling off portions of its balance sheet namely Land's End and its stake in Sears Canada, one of the largest e-commerce players in Canada. Sears stated that the company was looking to focus on becoming a more tech-driven retailer. Sears CEO and top shareholder said the sale of the key assets in the last year had given the retailer the money it needs to speed up its transformation. Sales dropped 10.3% in the final quarter of 2016 compared to the same period in 2015. 
2017 brought two major changes to the brand. Craftsman sold to Stanley Black & Decker for approximately $900 million, and Sears discontinued their 101-year-long association with appliance manufacturer Whirlpool. A Sears internal memo stated, Whirlpool has sought to use its dominant position in the marketplace to make demands that would have prohibited us from offering Whirlpool products to our members at a reasonable price. Sounds like some drama went down. Sears Holdings filed for Chapter 11 bankruptcy on October 15, 2018, ahead of a $134 million debt payment due that day. On November 23, 2018, Sears Holdings released a list of 505 stores, including 266 Sears stores, that were for sale in the bankruptcy process, while all others would hold liquidation sales. The person on the buyer's end of the deal was once again hedge fund controlled by CEO Eddie Lampert. On January 16, 2019, Sears Holdings announced it would remain open after Lampert won a bankruptcy auction, paying $5.2 billion. On February 7, 2019, a bankruptcy judge approved that $5.2 billion plan by Sears chairman and biggest shareholder to keep the business going. The approval meant approximately 425 stores, including 223 Sears stores, and about 45,000 jobs would be preserved. Many Sears stores closed between 2019 and 2021. As of September 2021, the company's website listed 35 Sears stores. Something else I wanted to mention regarding their decline is how they went about cost cutting. A report from a financial group that frankly I can just not pronounce said that Sears in 2017 was spending roughly 91 cents per square foot to make upgrades both online and in stores, while JCPenney spent $4.13, Kohl's was paying $8.12, and Best Buy was spending $15.36 per square foot to make enhancements. The customer experience is, in my opinion, not an area you can cheap out on. It's so important to present an image of modern, clean, and functional in an era where retail is so competitive, especially with um, the internet. I think what they should have done instead of not updating stores to a certain level was instead close the low-performing stores. This way you have fewer stores that you need to pour money into. In January 2022, Sears shut the remaining 15 auto centers in the U.S. As of September 1st, 2023, only 10 Sears stores remain in the continental United States. One in Seattle, two outside of San Francisco, one outside of L.A., one in El Paso, three in Florida, one in Jersey City, and one outside of Boston. There are two Kmarts in the continental U.S., one in Bridgehampton and the other in Miami. Something interesting, Mall of America gave Sears a 100-year lease for a price of only $10 per year. However, in April 2023, the Supreme Court, in a 9-0 ruling, allowed Mall of America to fight their lease with Sears in a lower court. The space leased by Sears is 120,000 square feet and has been vacant since 2019. I need to mention the Walmart factor. They became the nation's largest retailer by revenue in 1990 and had already become more profitable than Sears and Kmart by the late 80s. If you look at the brand's net square footage, it tells a similar story. In 1994, Sears had 75.4 million square feet of retail space. 10 years later, in 2004, they had 93.9 million. By comparison, Walmart had 176.3 million in 1994, 
and 422.9 million in 2004. Maybe Sears was a company that was only meant to survive in the 20th century. The major shift in retail and the advent of the internet completely changed everything for them. Sales for the company hit 53 billion in 2006 and dropped to just 3 billion in 2020. What are your thoughts on Sears? Do you miss it? What's your preferred retailer now? Leave a comment sharing your thoughts. All of the footage in this video comes from various tours posted to my channel. I invite you to like this video, subscribe for more tours and retail history. As always, I want to thank you so much for watching.